Hey there folks, this is a video I've been wanting to make for some time. I had to finish my previous campaign, so if you followed that playthrough, you know that that just ended. It took a while, uh, both in real life and in campaign. I went about 44 months, and one of the reasons why I prolonged that campaign was to kind of find out the, the long-term consequences of, of different policy choices. So that includes the grand strategy, uh, policies you can see uh, this is a spring 61 CSA campaign so my policies are up there in the top right I took two recruitment focused ones uh, on on uh, filibustering and native allies and slaves to the west those three in general I, I felt were somewhat under underpowered and so I thought that, that was a, a way to deal with right I, I when I started this campaign it was uh, pre-version 1.0 and so uh, you know there's different AI and all that but I felt that taking some weaker policies might might even things out. And so that's that's there. And I'll talk about some of the, the policies and acts I researched, as well as uh, some of the fiscal decisions I made about subsidies and tax rates and, and, and all that other stuff. So since there is a lot here, I am going to try to just jump right into it. And I'm going to start out with the effects on recruitment, since two of my three big uh, grand strategies were more recruitment focused. This is what the recruitment picture looked like after six months. You can see the date up there, it's September 1st, right, with the campaign start, I think, of February 15th or so. Uh, we, we actually have a pretty good pool of volunteers uh, six months in. You can see uh, the recruits from Cuba, Nicaragua, and New Mexico territory are all on this screen. And, you know, collectively, they're giving me about 10,000 of almost... 70,000, it's more than 10,000. That's what happens when you, when you try to add quickly. But uh, it, it's, it's probably less than 25% than of my overall number of, of volunteers, but you know they're, they're there. Okay, these next three, and uh, the reason why it's kind of obscured is because that's how I took the screenshot. I can't really undo it. But this is 18 months in. And so when I report things, when I say it's 18 uh, months in, in, in the other slides that give you graphs, remember that that will show you the, the kind of trailing... 12 months in most of those cases. But this is just a snapshot of what it looks like one year after the previous slide. And there are a few here for this one, uh, but we see that the total is gonna be 143,000 volunteers plus 343,000 uh, draftees if I wanted them. This is the second slide here from 18 months in. You can see here that uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, and New Mexico are collectively contributing a good chunk of volunteers. Uh, this is my kind of commentary on it, though. It, it's superfluous. Uh, the, the point has passed in the campaign, and it does not return where I'm going to need very, very large armies. And, and I understand from, from talking to people in different for that, uh, you know, some of them have much larger armies on both sides in, in their spring CSA or USA starts. I, I can't explain it, but those are what the, the numbers look like for, for me. So, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to know that they're there. And I did recruit. You can see that I do have some in service, but very, very few. Uh, I think I mostly recruited them in a horse artillery but battalions. And my view is that grand strategies and policies and acts, uh, they, they should go to address the most pressing needs. If you end up with a surfeit of manpower, then taking pre-war policies that give you more manpower don't really fix a problem that, that you have. And this is just the last one here from... I believe this is the last one here from the 18-month re recruitment. Uh, now, this must be a little bit later. I, I must have screwed up the, the, the titles, but whatever, uh, because here it looks like the numbers for Cuba, Nicaragua, and, and New Mexico are, are slightly off. But this is November 1862, so this is right around the time of the midterm elections in the game. Okay, and this is the first of three slides for... 36 months in, or, or just about 36 months in, you can see, again, way more manpower than, than I'm ever going to need. Yeah, and the numbers here from Cuba, Nicaragua, and, and, and New Mexico, they're, they're huge, right? You can't really argue 
that's 200, it's more than 250,000 or about a third of the total number of volunteers available to the Confederacy at this point, 36 months in. But as you can see, manpower has not been a particular interest of mine. If you look over to the number of men fielded, I have under 200,000. So draftees aren't important to me. Uh, having that many extra volunteers is not particularly relevant to me. All right, some additional stuff here on recruitment. I'll let you, you can pause the screen if there's anything you want to see here, but these are just what the, the numbers look like. You can see the Arizona Territory. Uh, all right, we're getting a little bit from that. Indian Territory, which I don't think I mentioned earlier, is also contributing significant numbers. And so when all of this adds up, yeah, it's, it's a significant overall component, but I, I'm still not seeing that it, it fixes a problem I, I have. And... I don't know why this says slide three. It looks exactly the same. All right, I, I think I'm just going to move on to a different topic, but that's what the recruitment picture looked like for me throughout that campaign. Okay, so I'm into the economy stuff, and the economy and the fiscal stuff is what takes up uh, pretty much the rest of this this video. And so here we have the, the trailing 12-month stuff. This was taken about 12 months. Yeah, right, February 15th, 1862. So this is taken one year into the campaign, and this is the economy overview. You can notice that in general, the CSA and the union economies in general tend to trend in the same directions. When one peaks, the other peaks. When one begins to trough, the other begins to trough. I actually found that a little bit frustrating, although though understandable. And of course, when the union peaks, they really peak, uh, as we can see in that, that blip right there. It looks like between November and, and December. All right, this one is, what do I have this down as? The 29-month slide. So it's the 29th month and then 12 months before that on your, your far left. And again, you can see the same, same trends are, are kind of continuing. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. Uh, I believe, this is one of the other things I noticed, that I think that this is the beginning of a long-term recession that, spoiler alert, ends up developing into a depression. Now, for the careful reader at home, you can see that there's some other good fiscal news below the, the, the graph. I'm not talking about that yet, but you might want to keep that in, in, in the background uh, when I talk about those other, those other uh, economic and fiscal policies and effects. All right, I had a slide for both a 43 and a 45 months. So this is it at 45 months. And since that would basically be the same, you can then subtract back 12 months and you can see, yeah, it was generally bad news for both sides economy and you can see that the economy has now turned to depression uh, in the uh, little bit more detailed section below the the bar graphs because the recessions wore on so long and eventually became categorized as a, as a depression uh, and the, the the union total level of goods produced is starting to approach the csa one so anyways that's where it is and remember at that point the, the campaign is just about over and for all intents and purposes really had been over and uh, the next thing I'm going to take a look at when I talk about general economic performance is public wealth and then I'm going to dig into the policies acts and and budgetary issues I don't find this slide terribly useful but it's the 12 month uh, it, it's weird because they call it both I think sometimes public wealth and private wealth uh, but basically how wealthy each you know, uh, people are, are on average and higher is, is better. Uh, we'll turn to other ones because this one is weird. All right, so I have this one labeled the 29-month uh, wealth report. And, and, and I'll pause here and say, at this point in the campaign, I was pretty flabbergasted that, that things had gone the, the way they did. Uh, I thought my per capita wealth would be much, would be appreciably higher. I mean, for more than the first year, and I think close to the first 18, 24 months, the economy was uh, introducing 10 to 15 new businesses a month. Uh, there were taxes, uh, but they were relatively low. Uh, and a lot of the new business startups were in heavy industry. Uh, coupled with that, exports were booming far faster than, than imports, and one would think that that would be a, another potential boon to private wealth. 
Uh, in the beginning, exports range from 40 to 50 million dollars a month. To by the end of the campaign, we were exporting about 170 million dollars a month. And in terms of the the import numbers, early on we were importing about 10 to 20 million a month. So that meant that the 40 to 50 million in exports minus 10 to 20 million in, in imports, we had a favorable balance of trade of at least 20 to 40 million dollars a month early on. And by the end of the campaign, when we were doing 150, 170 million dollars a month in exports, we were only importing 25 to 30 million dollars a month, which meant the trade surplus had boomed considerably. And I would have thought that the uh, extra capital would have been invested more, more productively uh, and, and, and led to greater per capita growth. But it didn't. And one of the other things you'll see on this graph is right around, where is it? October, November, the effects of reserve notes kicked in. And so I had grown frustrated up to, to well before that point because I had to make the, the decision to research that action. But I, I was disappointed that per capita wealth wasn't growing. So one of the things I thought is, well, maybe if I take out reserve notes, I'll get the whatever it is, $50 million a year. Public wealth will take a hit, but then maybe it'll come back. And so I'll continually get the $50 million. It felt early enough in the campaign that, and, and my fiscal position was, if I remember at this point, uh, somewhat dire. And I figured, all right, well, maybe we can we can build back. Since I'm not getting per capita growth right now, maybe it'll kick back in once once it drops. I don't know. It was worth a try. And as you can see, that it, it doesn't ha it does happen. Okay, you'll you'll see in the next slide. Maybe I'll just move to the next slide. Yeah, and this next slide is the 37 month public or private wealth, basically the the, the per person wealth. Uh, it does recover, and, and you got to remember that the graphs. Uh, its axis, the, the scale on the right is is shifting. And so it kind of looks like we've grown a lot more than, than, than we are, but we're just back at, I think it's 0 0.42. And what this is really showing is kind of how the, the Confederacy has uh, separated itself from the union in terms of per person wealth. Uh, I think I have one more slide here on per capita wealth. Yeah, this is the last one. This is the 43-month public wealth when the campaign is almost over. You can see that the union per person wealth has really declined. This is also the time, you remember that earlier slide, when their economy was reverting to about the level of the, the CSAs. And you can see the CSA per person wealth, yeah, it is, it is rising ever so slightly, but it just felt that for the other parts of, of the economy, it, it didn't feel all that great. And you can see also... Uh, that at this point, though income tax was higher and I previously had a corporate tax, I began cutting those those things. The only thing I left in place were, were tariffs. Uh, if I were going to do this over again, maybe since the, the, the balance of trade wasn't really leading to a richer per person society, maybe it would make sense to just cut tariffs. Uh, but I will say, well, I, I have something to say about tariffs when I talk about revenue. So I'll talk about what I found when I when I mess with tariffs uh, and the effect on revenue when I when I get there. But I'm not to revenues yet because I want to talk about expenses, and so I'll talk about total expenses and then some of the the, the largest contributing factors to those those expenses. But this this is the first 12 month expenditures for us. You can I mean you can just read the graph right. Red is CSA, blue is Union, and 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 there it is. And here we go at, I think it's 30, 30 months in. Uh, and so 30 months and then the, the 12 months that were, were proceeding. So there's a bit of a gap in, in the graphs, but you can see that my expenses, right, this is expenses, are going to absolutely balloon. And if you're looking on the left-hand side, you, you kind of can see why, but not really, because we kind of missed the part where this got really, really bad. And this might be in one of the, the, the slides that are coming up next. Uh, we're talking about the supply depot, but the, the big reason for that huge arc up, uh, what is that, around January or so, is because of an up, I'll say it's because it was an update to the game, supply depot costs end up skyrocketing and uh, things get very economically precarious.
But anyways, that was the trajectory uh, going for 12 months going into month 30. And who would have thought it? These are the expenses at month 40. And so this goes from 28 to well, 40, right? So anyways, there that is. You can see that they came down appreciably. And you can't quite see why because I, when I took the screenshot, I had the cursor over the Supply Depot. But Supply Depot uh, cost decrease. So that, that was pretty good. And you can see that the, the union's uh, total costs do not follow that same trend. They, they do up to a point, but then they kind of get stuck in a, in a peak in a trough, and they, they never really break below that. All right, so some of the factors that really weighed on expenses. This is the, you, you can read, right? Cost of supply depots for the, the Confederacy. And in this case, and it's one of the kind of confusing things about these graphs, um, when it goes down <laughs> on this graph, it actually means the cost is, is increasing because it's the, the deficit, because you're not making money from supply depots, which you probably should be, right? Because it's listed under the expense column. And so it's it's a little bit, I, I think, backwards as to what you would expect. The, the supply depot cost did not decrease and then increase. They increased dramatically, and then they began decreasing significantly over the long term. All right, and this is the screenshot of supply depot cost at 37 months. So it takes into account, again, the 12 months before that. And as that red line is sloping up, that's actually showing the decreasing cost of, of supply depots. And if you can just peek under my cursor, you can see that now the, the cost of supply depots are down to just $122 million projected on a 12-month basis. That was a huge improvement over the worst of the supply depot uh, cost at one point the projected annual contribution to the deficit was nine hundred million dollars, uh, but five months after that kind of low for me, uh, then the projected impact of supply depot costs had been cut in half to about four hundred fifty million, and you can see later on here uh, it it decreases sharply after that, and it becomes far more far more manageable. All right, another major expense here was on the Army upkeep side. No surprise there. These are the first 12 months and what Army upkeep was costing me. So this is right around the 29 or 30 month mark in the, the campaign. And you can see that my Army upkeep costs have, have fallen you know, pretty significantly, especially if you're paying attention to, to the scale on the right-hand side of that graph. Uh, I speculated in my first video on the economy that I thought Impressment Act might reduce Army upkeep cost. And I can confirm that it certainly seemed that way from this campaign. Uh, at least it was correlated with a long-term significant decrease in my Army upkeep cost, uh, which until the Supply Depot cost kicked in, they were usually my single largest annual expense. Uh, I went through um, a pretty significant round of uh, army buildup in late 1862, early 1863. Despite that buildup, my upkeep costs fell to around 50 to 60 million. And, and I think the reason, again, is uh, passing that Impressment Act. So there is a cost for it, but it, it definitely felt like it was worth it. And the 50 to 60 million dollar annual projected cost for army upkeep was a decline of nearly two thirds from what it had been about a year earlier in early 62, when the projected annual upkeep costs were around 125 to 150 million. Um, I, I, I can't really explain why that is. I, I, I think a lot of it is attributed to the Impressment Act, or at least some of it is, uh, but I can at least report it. And this is my final one here at 37 months. So uh, we're about six months from the end of the campaign. Uh, overall costs are are really quite low. You can see it's you know it's 80 million. All right, it you know it's it's maybe ticked up a little bit from from what it was. Uh, I don't know how much of that because in the middle of this campaign the supply depot cost got got kicked into it, and so that might have uh, some of the army upkeep costs may or may not have gone kicked to supply depot. I really don't know, but I'll say that one of the takeaways from here is I think Impressment Act is 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 worth it especially if you're in somewhat dire fiscal straits. If you're not, maybe it's not worth the cost, but 
Um, I, I thought it was. So maybe this one would, would have made more sense to talk about after I did revenue, but I did have a screenshot on the 12 month national debt of the Confederacy. You can see there's an arms buildup. We don't have the fiscal wherewithal to, to absorb all of it. And so we, we solved that problem by taking on debt and presenting new problems for the future. All right, here is the only screenshot I have of interest rates. Um, and this is, I believe is also after 12, yeah, it's 12 months, uh, February of 1862. A lot of campaigns I played up until this point, I was kind of okay with just getting them done as soon as they were done. And, and so I was used to just, I thought normal interest rates were going to be around 8%. But what I began to see, and it is a really precipitous drop off, you can see on that the right hand part of that graph, uh, is that interest rates begin a long term plunge for reasons I'm not really sure. Because in February of 1862, there is going to be a significant increase. Uh, in my borrowing due to the supply depot cost. Now it is true that, uh, and I'll talk about some, some of the acts in, in a little bit, I was hitting the paint pretty hard on the fiscal acts. And so that tended to improve my, my credit rating, but I was really surprised how low the, the interest rates would, would go. So my very last slide here on costs is the cost, of the, the projected annual cost of my debt. And this is taken around the 30 month mark. Yeah, July of 1863. So uh, the supply depot costs have begun to to kick in. And so my overall debt, though I don't, I can't show it to you here, it is it is growing, but the actual cost of that debt is plummeting. And if you saw in the previous slide, the interest rate then, which I thought was low at around six and change, is now down to almost two and a half percent and spoiler alert, later on, it's going to go to sub 2%. And so, yeah, there is a large debt that needs to be repaid, but you're focusing month to month, year to year. The actual cost of that debt has dropped precipitously, which frees up uh, money uh, elsewhere. And, and this happened in tandem later with, uh, actually, you can see it at this point already, I think supply depot costs, I think they're starting to come down already. And my army upkeep costs had, well, here they've spiked up. But I do know that they end up trailing down over the, the long term, as I just covered in that, that previous slide. If I recall this one correctly, the interest rates through the first half of 63 are going to be around 4%. Then they fall to about 3%. I did take some notes as I was doing this because I, I, I planned on, on reporting it. Uh, and, and so those interest rates are falling, but my, my total debt was up around $2 billion. I think that's about where it ends up peaking. Uh, and the annual interest cost had fallen to 70 million, which was less than when I had far less debt, less than a billion dollars, but the interest rates were eight or 10%. Uh, and I can tell you that by the time I get to 1864, I think it's the spring or summer, uh, the fiscal position so improves that the government begins buying back its bonds and we end up getting the total debt down to one and a half billion and at the very end of the campaign, I believe the projected annual interest costs were just 30 to $40 million. All right, the revenue side of things is, I, I think there's less to report. I mean, this is the first 12 months. I cannot explain those spikes. I, 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 maybe those are imports of arms that I, I purchased in the early arms buildup. Um, I, I find it hard. To, I, I guess I had Diplomacy One done at that point, and maybe we were ordering them from from abroad, and that that accounts for it. Uh, but but there it is. This is the revenue picture at at thirty months and the the twelve months preceding it. So one of the things I did, I think it was early sixty two or sixty three, wh whatever the case was, I slashed tariffs, or at least in my view, I slashed tariffs, tariffs from 50% to 30%. Uh, however, after a few months, we really weren't importing anything. Now, maybe I should have left them down longer. That's, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what I was supposed to do. Uh, oh, wait, 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 I'm sorry. I'm doing this wrong. So <clears throat> what happened was I increased tariffs from 30 to 50%. That's, 
but it basically brought in no new money because I wasn't importing much back when tariffs were 30%. So what it really did was sour relations a bit with the, the Europeans. Then what I tried after that, all right, so raising tariffs didn't bring in more money. Well, what if I cut them? And so I cut tariffs down to 25% from 50%. However, what I found after watching the results of that for several months is that it didn't really seem to help the economy at all. It didn't reduce import costs. Uh, it did not seem to correlate with a general improvement of the economy. As I've already said, it wasn't correlated with a rise in per capita wealth, but it did help balloon my deficit, which was already under, under pressure. I think it happened around the time the, the supply depot cost kicks in. And so I just said, well, we're ending this experiment, jack the tariffs all the way back up to 50%, you know, went full economic nationalism on them. And uh, that was pretty much it. I think I have one more slide here on revenues from late in the war. Yep, this is the last one. This is the 40-month uh, revenue report. And, you know, there are there are some jumps and, and some declines. But, again, if you pay attention to that right-hand column, it, it seems like it's a big deal. But the much bigger story toward, you know, we didn't balance the budget, but um, the decline in the annual deficit was the decline in expenses, not the increase in, in revenues. And one of the things I do late in the war is, um, this is 1864, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out about the, the per person wealth not growing and the long-term recession that turns into a depression. And so I do begin cutting taxes. There was a corporate tax. There was an income tax or sales tax that had always been there. And as you can see, I eliminated the corporate tax. Uh, I, I, I reduced the income tax. I might've reduced it a bit further. I think I got close to eliminating the, the sales tax. Uh, I have too little, too little evidence as to whether that, that helped uh, or, or not. I thought I had, read in, in something that Grand Tactician put out, I thought maybe it was the manual, which is that if, if wealth was low, you know, mediocre, not rich, that generally consumption harmed the economy. And so I figured anything below 0 0.50 was considered kind of low. And so my, my view was don't orient things towards consumption. And so keep the, the taxes on. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they were close enough to being you know, a consumption-based economy that I, I could have cut all those costs. We'll never know because I didn't do it, but we'll have to try it again in a, another campaign. So what I have for you now is some of the stuff related to uh, the price of individual goods. And what I start out with first here is food. And for a lot of these, I don't have anything, I don't have much to say. So I'll just show you the slides. And there's no way yet to make these graphs larger. So you kind of just got to take a look at it on the, the left and go from there. But again, uh, this is the 12-month 12, the 12 snapshot of how food prices changed for both sides in the preceding year. This is around 29, 30 months of how the price of food has increased. All right, and this is 36, 37 months in. Uh, so we're in 1864 here, and you can see that now the prices, the price for, for food is beginning to decline. Um, I'm going to show you a few slides here of things that are kind of tangentially related to, to food. So obviously not food, but it's the price of, of, of crops. I actually kind of found this one a bit strange. Right, so this, well, I guess this is also late. This is March 1864, so this is about 36, 37 months in. Uh, yeah, I guess at this point, food prices are, are falling as well. It looks like the this, uh, kind of uh, steepness of the decline seems more pronounced than the overall cost of, of food, but I only have the one slide for this and here it is. So this is the 29 month cost of provisions, which I thought would be somewhat related to food. I, I guess it isn't the, I, I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It, it's not always clear to me what, what exactly some of these things are, but there's your provisions. And what would a war be without coffee? 
So my prices are relative. This is 36, 37 months in. And you can see the union's price of coffee has, has declined, and, and so is the CSAs. All right, I have two slides here on weapons cost. Uh, this first one is 12 months. So going back to the start of the war, I mean, both sides are engaged in a military buildup. Weapons cost goes up. Seems like it makes sense. And here we are at 29 months into the war and the 12 months before we see the average price of weapons for both sides drops. The Union's was more gradual. Mine was a very steep drop. Uh, and then they kind of normalize around similar price levels uh, eventually on the, the right-hand side of that graph. I admittedly, I probably should have mentioned this a bit earlier, but I can do it while this graph is, is up. Uh, several of the units that were on one-year contracts for their initial recruitment, they expired uh, sometime in the first half of 1862, but I probably still kept about one-half to one-third of them. They had staggered end dates to those contracts, and so my, my total number of men under arms at that point in the war was about 130 to 115,000. It would sometimes drop from around 130 back to 115, but then new recruits came in to uh, replace those who had left. Uh, training levels remained excellent in those units, even though one third of them were recruits. And so I thought that was a bit strange that the average, uh, you know, experience of a unit wasn't reduced to take into account that there were a lot of folks who hadn't seen any combat and would go on to see very little combat. I understand that uh, combat experience was building up as more battles took place, and I think that, that increased increases the, the rate of training or, or something like that. Uh, but still, I, I was surprised that there wasn't a, a greater hit to unit experience when so many of the, the folks who had fought left and uh, I, I guess didn't re-up. I'm not really sure if the people who came back were, you know, proxying people who had never been in the war or people who had, who had left and came back. <laughs> Yet another thing I probably should have mentioned just at the beginning of the weapons segment, which is that because I started the campaign pre-version 1.0, there was an old bugged problem with getting the weapons you were supposed to. Uh, I, I went through a pretty significant qualitative buildup in the summer of 62 because there had kind of been a drought for about a year in terms of, of quality weapons being produced, even though I had diplomacy one and I'd gone through industri industry two before 61 came to an end, uh, it looked like a lot of the advanced small arms that the CSA should have had, uh, I, I ended up not getting or getting only very late in 1862. So I think in the beginning of 1862, I got one hall rifle, which is not advanced, uh, and I got two Mississippis, which were, right, they're, they're not advanced either. But although you know, in terms of quality, they're, they're fine and better than a Springfield musket or mixed muskets or anything like that. But uh, I think in terms of advanced weapons that I got in 1862, I think I got one brigade to have Richmond rifles and one got Fayettevilles. That was about it. I mean, it was a somewhat nice surprise that I was able to give one infantry brigade Merrill carbines, which are usually, you know, cav weapons. Uh, and, and that has a very nice rate of fire. It's not the greatest but it, it, it's something it was good but i would have liked to have seen uh more but it was just because it was a bugged version and so i have to play through another campaign to to, to make sure that that is no longer the, the case but i look forward to confirming that all right true to form i have not been quick uh you can't really see it because there's some sort of error in the the text but this is the 12 month small arms and ammunition price from the beginning of the war to, to 12 months in I don't think there are any big surprises there. And this is, I think, around 29 months or so in... Yeah, some, something like that. And there, there was a lot of fighting in 1861, and a little bit comes back in, in 63. But anyways, those are your, your the only two slides I have for uh, small arms ammo, but that's what happens with its prices in the first 29 months. All right, and what would 
campaign be if it weren't for artillery? So we got three slides for artillery. This is the first 12 months of what happens with artillery prices. These are artillery prices around 29 months. And my last one here for artillery is 37 months into campaign. You see a long-term decline in, in artillery prices. I think it has to do with less demand. Um, I mean, for the last 18 months or so, I don't I don't know if I recruited any anything new, and so it would just be replacing other things. The depots had gone through their their restocking phase, and so I assume that also accounts for it. I don't know if scale of production and, and in you know declining input costs, if there were declining input costs, I don't know that. I don't know what what factor they might have played in that, but. Uh, Anyways, that's that's what happened with artillery prices late in the war. Yes, believe it or not, I also catalog uniform costs. I, I don't know why I do the things I do. But anyways, this is the first one, 12 months in. And right around 29 months in, that's what's going on with uniform costs. I have requested, and I don't, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, they can make those graphs a little bit larger so we can actually read them, maybe pop out and go back more than 12 months, but at least a little bit larger because it's not worth ruining your eyesight to, to read but you get the trend idea and 37 month cost of, of uniforms so I assume they're, they're higher well it doesn't matter why I assume that they're higher here but there they are <laughs> yes I, I have two slides to show you the, the, the cost of bricks I thought the cost of brick was associated with fort construction I have no idea if that I have no idea right now, my brain is a little fried, as to whether that's true. But this is from the first 12 months, and I was kind of going ham on the fort. So this might actually be right. And the price of brick at 29 months and the preceding 12 months. So it's more expensive in the, the CSA. It seems consistently so, although the union was, was catching up at that point for, for some reason. All right, so I have two slides here for, for locomotives and I'll just use the opportunity well it's on the screen to talk a little bit about how, how railroads went uh, it, it seemed a little bit slow but I didn't take you know Southern Southern Pacific Railroad which maybe I, I would do in, in retrospect uh, but going into 1862 1863 I finished my second line and, and started my third by early 1863, my third line, which was the Cumberland Gap line, was about two-thirds of the way complete. I, I would say as a rule of thumb, it felt like I was getting a new line done about every nine months. I understand that, that doesn't necessarily translate to, to locomotives, but like, what else? when else am I going to get to talk about this? So I'm, I'm talking about it now. And here's your 29-month locomotive uh, update. I previously in a different video recommended that, that railroads should be built near the front lines because, or that they shouldn't be built near front lines because they're subject to, to raids and, and, and capture. Uh, I, I think it, it might make sense to maybe build them through other areas of, of supply dead zone because uh, A, they'll increase the speed of stuff moving in, into those dead zones. So if you build a supply depot there, or you have a force that unfortunately is there, uh, they can at least get provisions to a, a supply depot. And that's where, you know, one of the areas where I think it makes sense to have a supply depot. It doesn't really make sense to build them in areas where, you know, there's, there's abundant supply already. The other reason why it might make sense to build railroads through relative or near relative dead zones where your army's reliably predict that they're probably going to need to move is that if you're going to be in a dead zone, you might as well be on a locomotive moving through it very quickly rather than, you know, being starved and, and not being able to, 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 to march through there if you don't have a supply depot or stuff doesn't move quick enough. Anyways, that's what happened with the price of, of locomotives. As you can see, mine was high and remained high. The AIs at one point was, was as high as mine or a couple points was as high as mine. Uh, before it, it declined. I don't know if they stopped building them. I, I think it probably has more to do with how much you're using them, but I, I'm really not not terribly sure. All right, I have two slides for, for machine parts. 
Uh, again, you can read the dates by now. This is one month, one month, one year in. Uh, I thought this might be a, a kind of proxy for industrialization and also for locomotives, I think. I don't know. I, I, I have to go back, and I, I never made the video on, on production. Even though I've tried to understand how it works, a lot of the stuff doesn't doesn't make too much sense to me. So anyways, here's the first one for machine parts. And this is the other one with the, the cost of machine parts. You can see they kind of level off for me, slightly decline, but pretty much are leveling off at that point. The union at that point is, is starting to see an increase in theirs. I don't know why, because I, I, I don't know why. The, the, the information that's in the left-hand corner of these, when I click through the, the different products, it, it, it still kind of baffles me. I mean, if, if there's only demand for 1.4 pieces of machine parts, and you have 16,000 of them in stock while you're producing 303. I don't know how that's worth $92. I mean, it seems like it should be worth maybe the seven cents, but not the $92 before because there's just way too much of it uh, that, that is available. I, like I said, I don't know, but there that is. All right, and now I have just a, a few one-offs for, for goods that I got screenshots of. And, and so this one is cotton one year in. The price of decline, I, I really found this one also kind of, I don't know, surpri I guess it's surprising. There was absolutely no demand for cotton. <laughs> 12 months in, and we, we were producing a ton of it, and there was already a ton of it in, in stock. And to me, like we're exporting a lot to the UK and to France and a fair amount to, to Spain and also, yeah, to, 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 to the north. Uh, but I was surprised with the, the rate of new industry growth that there weren't some textile manufacturers or other folks that were using it, even if the uniforms contained wool. And I don't know, I'm not a, not a civil, civil war buff. Uh, but if there was no cotton in that, that production at all, really, I, I, I don't know. All right. And, and so this is kind of related to that, but it's the, the you could read, right? It's the cost of clothing. And this is way in, though. This is. Uh, let's see, one, two, three years into the the campaign, it's but it's more expensive in in the CSA than it is in the the union. Uh, all right, well n now you know. And around the 29 month mark, we got the cost of iron ore, and next we'll do one that is iron. And so at least it's at the same time as the previous slide see that the price of iron there is is what it is uh, but yeah all right so as I'm I'm rounding this out uh, you can't quite see all the the policies that I've done but I do recall most all of the the ten and there's no real big surprise I mean if you watch the playthrough you, I, I think I probably talk about it in, in there as well but I only go as far as diplomacy one there is an argument to be made for Diplomacy 2 to get some, some decent imported CAV weapons, but in the end, Industry 2 made more sense to me, and it didn't really matter in retrospect, because if the weapons production and import stuff is bugged, I wasn't going to really see the, the payout over the long term. Uh, for whatever reason, I did not take a screenshot further down. Uh, I go through funding 1, 2, and 3. Uh, you can see I do the, the I do the print notes one. I don't really like the downside of it. I don't like reducing public wealth if I can, or they call it private wealth, but whatever the per person wealth. Uh, I go through industry two. I, I do have the capacity to, to levy the income tax and the raise taxes on corporations, and then I go to funding three. And so all of those things help improve the the credit rating. And I think I get to most of that. I probably get to funding one in late sixty one. And I think I'm focused for about the next year on funding policies. But I'll, I'll also say at that point, I had pretty much done most of the other things I wanted. I did military one. I think I go back and I grab military two, maybe in 1862. It's like the one non-funding branch thing that I did. Uh, but I, I was really looking forward to getting the, what is it? It's the Banking Act bank act or something like that but that's the one that gives you the 150 million dollars annually and it costs you three state support and to me that that seems like a, a bargain i'd much rather do that right you get three times the, the the kind of benefit though it tends to come later because it's a further policy you have to get it's got a longer research time than print notes one or or two 
Uh, but it just seems like, you know, you get basically three years worth of benefits in, in one thing if you're willing to invest the time to do that. Uh, but you can see that I, I did go down to agricultural too. Uh, that's not one I'm, I'm sure really made all that sense. And, and you know, maybe it could have made, something else could have happened. Uh, the campaign itself ends in the 1864 election. That's the only conclusion I have. The union was okay. There were around 30 supporters or so, and then November happened, and all of a sudden it dropped to like 12. And so I'm interpreting that as uh, Lincoln lost the, the re-election, and that was the, the end of the war. Before I got there, this was around 30, 29, 30 months in, uh, state support is, is low, not because of whatever the Banking Act or, wh or whatever it's called, it's because I accidentally started raids in Kentucky and I think also Missouri, but I also experienced what others have reported of just perpetually low CSA support in, in Missouri. I, I'm not really sure. I, I know how I got it. I ejected the, the, the Union armies from it, but I'm not sure why that would lead them to come over to, to the CSA side if, if they didn't support it more. And in Kentucky, it felt like you got punished real hard real quick. The, the army was on the border, and I was going to send them into, I think it was southern Indiana or Ohio, and I was just getting them in raiding stance right before they jumped across the river, and <laughs> Kentucky hated me for the rest of the game. I don't think my support ever got above 50%. So, whatever. I, I think that that was later fixed in, in, a different, in a different patch, and I don't know if it didn't carry over or whatever. I, I don't know. Um, I also found that between here and the end of the campaign that uh, Virginia support fell to 80%, which I thought was, was pretty low. I wonder if it's because the Union took Grafton twice before I, I uh, forced them to, to fall back. But the other kind of core CSA states, their, their support was generally pretty pretty good, around 97 or so for, for most of the war into 1864. Though I did notice that national support, so it, it goes up after this. I don't have a slide for it, but I, I think it might be captured in some of the campaign videos. It goes up to around 90, and then it starts dropping to 85. And I wasn't sure if that was a, a result of the, the Banking Act policy or, or what. And this is how it ended. So at least I, I can give you the final score. Yeah, national support for me dropped again to 75 after. I, I, you know what? I, I was confusing national morale and national support. Yeah, national support just stayed in the mid-70s. And I think it's because Missouri and Kentucky were so low. I, I think maybe because Missouri might, might be bugged or maybe it's a feature. Who knows? Uh, and then in Kentucky, I think it might have been that accidental raid, uh, which really turned the, the state against me for the entire war. Uh, anyways... Uh, that's that's how it ended. I think that this campaign, the economic overview, as much as I've tried to, to present and, and cover a lot in a little bit of time, and maybe I did the reverse, I covered a little in a lot of time, uh, it, it, to me it still raises a lot more questions than, than it answers them, and this kind of feels like <laughs> back in the day, many of you may not understand this reference, you know, somebody takes a trip and they give you like the slideshow of how the trip went. That's kind of how this this has felt, like the slideshow of my trip through the spring 61 CSA campaign. But anyways, uh, and, and the effects on the, the economy, the other kind of long-term effects of, of different um, decisions that were made. I, I said, I think I said this somewhere, I did not design this campaign to have it be an economic walkthrough. It's something I kind of decided like a year or two into it and I was like, all right, let's just go for it. You know, if not now, I'll, I'll never do it. Uh, but when I dig into the goods and trade screen, I didn't have, e I didn't have anything in here even about, about trade. Uh, it's really wild. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm still not getting the, the kind of core supply and, and demand and price stuff. It just doesn't make sense to me. I can kind of understand, you know, input costs leading to, to final products. And I'd like to maybe do a deeper dive, maybe in the, the campaign that, uh, I, I might start here into tracking how the, the price of underlying goods link to changes in you know later stage goods. Uh, that might be interesting to, to do. I'd really like to understand how this, this stuff works. Uh, again, the, the, the grand 
policies that I, that I took. I, I don't strongly recommend the, the recruitment focused ones, and I consider filibustering and native allies kind of recruitment focused ones. Uh, because at least for me in this campaign, numbers weren't a problem. And so more numbers wasn't really solving a problem that, that I had. I don't really know what the problems were. Probably some quality weaponry, sure. Uh, maybe uh, something to enrich the citizens a little bit, you know, because it, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, and, and so there are some, some policies that do that. I think when you take the railroads, and, and that policy is really coming around to me, you know, it's only a, like a plus two credit rating or something like that, but it increases construction time. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I felt like I was building about a railroad every, uh, a line about every nine months or so on, on average throughout this, this campaign, which wasn't, wasn't bad, but uh, I didn't finish them all by the time it was, was over. Uh, but I, I'd like to know a lot more and do a lot more, more digging and maybe get a little bit more information and at least bigger graphs and uh, maybe the historical price of, of certain goods throughout the entire campaign. I think that would be I think that would be cool, and maybe also graphs that explain why products, it, it, like a like a late stage product, how the prices of the underlying components changed over time affected its its final price along with supply and demand. I think that would be super cool. I'm now getting into a different video where I talk about things that you know I, I'd like to see and probably won't happen, uh, and and so I'm gonna gonna wrap it here. Anyways, I hope you learned something from this. Uh, certainly, if you've been here this long, uh, you, you did. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll see what's coming next. I don't know. I, I still want to do a, a talk through on unit prefs. And uh, I also want to get another, another campaign playthrough going because now I'll finally have a campaign that started post 1.0. And, hey, we got the eye candy that are the 3D models. All right, until then, folks, take care.